Hello to everybody from Charm Health. Um, welcome to the Charm Health Educational Talk Series. My name is Renjani Rangan and I will serve as your host today. Our topic today is how world-class practices manage cash flow and patient collections. And today we have Andrew Harding. He's an RCM expert and vice president of customer success at Rivet Health. Andrew brings more than a decade of revenue cycle experience from the nation's leading RCM consultants to support process and organizational change for healthcare practices. As an experienced transformational consultant, apologize for that, uh, as an experienced transformational consultant uh, with extensive project work in operations management and process improvement, Andrew now caters to the provider side of healthcare revenue cycle. He brings a rare blend of operational awareness and analytical skills that help drive adaptation to support the quickly changing industry. He leverages data to identify leakage and develop sustainable project plans to improve the operational efficiency of people, processes and technology throughout the healthcare. Um, and welcome, Andrew. Very nice to have you here. A webinar on, on cash flow and how to manage patient collections is always timely. And uh, however, this is especially timely with respect to a new law, the No Surprises Act, which just passed two months ago in January. And Andrew Harding is going to help break down the No Surprises Act. In addition, um, we're going to look into how this law impacts your practice and how you will manage uh, your patient collections. And Andrew, as a transformational consultant and an experienced eye for process improvement, well, as he will probably tell you, not all patient collection tactics are created equal. With that, um, I'm going to pass it on to Andrew. Um, oh, I just have one more thing to say before I pass the baton over to you, Andrew. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by Charm Health. Uh, for those of you who are new to Charm, it is a meaningful use certified HIPAA compliant EHR with a fully functioning practice management telehealth patient portal, appointment scheduling, inventory billing, and more. It is an affordable cloud-based digital health platform to empower medical groups with clinical tools and technology that improve provider experience and patient outcomes that grow with your practice. Uh, Gartner Digital Markets is a trusted and prestigious research and advisory firm. They have awarded Charm Health for both customer satisfaction and usability for multiple years in a row. Uh, all right, with this, I will now pass it on to Andrew. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And that was, that was a very generous introduction. So I'll, I'll try and live up to that hype. Um, hopefully you can all see our, our homepage of, of Rivet and Charm Health and how world-class practices manage cash flow and patient collections. I'm just a, you know, we, we've got the audio portion that hopefully you can hear me okay, but we do have a, a screen share that we're going through. So uh, feel free to log into both uh, an audio and a, and a video or visual source to get going. Um, so with that quick introduction, um, so as, as you know, that's a little bit about me. Love Revenue Cycle, one of those like traditional revenue cycle nerds that geeks out on like reason codes and denials and you know authorizations, pre-certs, kind of the works front to back. So a little bit about my background and diving right into the agenda on what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so the first, uh, kind of the first couple sections are around like the relevance on why it matters and the impact that you can have uh, to financially clearing your patients up front. So really like why it makes sense, uh, some of the benefits and tips that we've seen be successful with a lot of different customers. And then there's a big component around communications, uh, whether that is, you know, just communicating with patients in general, connecting with your patients in a new era of consumerism, or um, transitioning to the fourth section of, you know, communicating things like good faith estimates to be in compliance with the No Surprises Act. Uh, so that's kind of the, um, the agenda that we'll run through. So let's, uh, let's dive in here, shall we? Um, so the first is always setting the context and some of this sometimes feels a little bit like emotional drowning of, oh my gosh, collecting from patients is really hard. And so we set the stage into why it matters. And um, we look at kind of the insurance landscape and there's a few key themes that we can pull out. Um, so the, the reason financially clearing patients makes sense, number one, like insurance is very cyclical, but it can often change and it changes kind of throughout the year, right? Most, you know, lots of people change jobs, change insurances, change plans within the same insurance company with different, you know, benefits, deductibles. And then you have this calendar component that 
the, the majority of insurance plans have deductibles and out-of-pockets that reset uh, you know, just recently in January. And so that opens up a you know, new opportunity for higher dollar or higher percentage of balances going to patient, uh, patient liability in the early parts of the year. So especially if you're, you know, if you work in any of these specialists that do maybe surgical procedures or any high dollar, uh, higher dollar in office procedure, kind of those dermatology, ophthalmology, uh, orthopedics, gastroenterology, um, even some of those office visits that are starting to uh, creep up in reimbursement, uh, you know, those percentages relative to the patient liability versus insurance liability make a big difference throughout the year. Um, and from a timing of things, it's always been really interesting because we see the, the types of services rendered get pushed off a lot of times until into the new year. And this may be, you know, I, I hypothesize it's because, uh, you know, the, like the undergrad economist in me thinks, hey, if you have a surgical procedure in January or February, you have the whole rest of the year to like maximize the deductible that you just hit. And so it's, it's really interesting looking at timing. And then the growth of different insurance plans, kind of these two graphs in the top, um, you see the growth of high deductible plans has been astronomical over the last you know, decade, decade and a half, where it's gone from uh, you know, this graph on the left-hand side, you know, a single digit percentage up to over a third of the, you know, the commercially insured patients are using a high dollar deductible plan or you know, an HDHP or HSA qualified plan. And so you're looking at what the qualification of those, all of a sudden it used to be, you know, legacy plans, it was pretty traditional to have a $100, a $250 deductible. And now it's actually quite common to see a $2,000, a $3,000, a $4,000 deductible plan. And so that's, you know, a lot of liability uh, sitting with the patients. Further, we look at, um, you know, I talked about this briefly, but the average patient responsibility per claim. Um, so this is a... Uh, a graph from claims that, that Rivet's platform actually populates, and we partition it out between patient responsibility and insurance responsibility. And uh, on the left hand, that's January, and then on the right hand, it's December, and you see that green line really tapers off from the first maybe quarter, quarter and a half, where over half of the bill is patient responsibility, right, deductible, coinsurance, through the end of the year where, you know, just a little over a third of the balance is going to patient responsibility. And so timing of when these patients are coming in for, uh, for these services rendered makes a big difference on maybe the risk or the, the magnitude of the patient liability. So we've seen timing, you know, timing can make a big, a big component and that's inevitably gonna drive to um, some accounts receivable. So whether it's aging accounts receivable or just, you know, short-term open AR, we see because of the balance or the percentage of AR going to patient responsibility, that starts to creep up. Um, so you know, we always like to kind of get a feel for the room and, and get an idea of maybe some of the pain points around, around patient liability and patient AR. So we'd love it if you wouldn't mind taking a second and, uh, and answering this question for us. But out of curiosity, what percentage of your total open accounts receivable belongs to patients? Um, so kind of that, you know, zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50 percent. And, and if it's higher than that, you know, higher than 50 percent, A, like, I'm really glad you're here to talk about this webinar. And B, like, feel free to just grab 40 to 50 percent as, as the threshold. So, yeah, like, as mentioned, just love to get a kind of indication from the group on kind of magnitude of impact of, of patient responsibility. So we'll give everyone just a, a few more seconds to, you know, to, to scramble your mouse and, and click on one of, one of the options and we'll kind of see the distribution. So, um, so Britton, let's go ahead and, and close that first poll. Um, yeah, so, so as, as expected, uh, you know, we've seen this grow and this may have, you may, may even uh, recognize that, um, you know, over the last, you know, maybe five to seven years, your percentage of uh, accounts receivable has crept up into that, you know, third or, you know, in some cases, 40 to 50%. So about a third of respondents said 40 to 50% of your AR is patients. Um, so glad, glad you're all here. Thanks so much for participating in our, our first poll. We'll have a couple more throughout the, uh, throughout the series. So um, now that we've set the stage for, hey, patient responsibility is no joke. It continues to increase in volume and size, and it's tough. We look at you know, some of the components about, around why it's so difficult. 
Um, so, you know, a lot of uh, physician practices, so these are actually, um, you know, some industry stats that we've pulled from different uh, data sources that we'd be happy to share. But about 83% of, of your smaller physician groups or provider practices said that the slow payment of high deductible plans are one of their top collection challenges, which is huge. I mean, that's that's a lot. And I think that's evidenced by the poll we just took that, you know, uh, when 40 to, 40 to 50% of your accounts receivable is coming from patients, and then look at the amount of, of patient responsibility that's written off or sent to collections or bad debt every year, like that's a very overwhelming impact. And then you flip that from the provider to the patient component, and you look at you know two thirds or 67% of Americans are, are you know pretty worried about how they cover unexpected medical bills. And so we'll talk a little bit about the unexpected and maybe the foreshadowing into the surprises act, but you know, it for most people, myself included, if we had you know a $10,000 emergency room bill, that would be a very, very uncomfortable day to have to pay for those balances. Um, and then on the right hand side, just kind of talk through, uh, you know, it is much harder to collect from uh, from patients than it is insurance companies. And part of the reason that uh, that we've seen this, why it's so much more difficult is insurance companies, you at least have a process to follow. You have a place that you submit claims. They have an, a duty and obligation to pay claims that, you know, are, are cleanly submitted. And you have like an escalation process, right? There's, you know, the many state insurance plans that you can go to the uh, the insurance bureaus and actually talk about, hey, this, this insurance company is doing this to us. Um, you don't have really that same remedy on the patient side of things. You don't necessarily have a guarantee that even the place that you're sending patient statements or bills to is a good address. You get a lot of return mail. Uh, they don't have the same you know, policies and manuals that a payer does. And so everything is done very ad hoc and you're trying your best to collect from patients. Um, so it really is a materially difficult or different, much more difficult process to collect from your patients than, uh, than insurance companies. And we have seen this shift from that last bullet kind of patients as consumers that you know the the modern world is developing to be very consumer mind you know consumer minded patient where they're used to this Amazon checkout where they can compare and contrast reviews and prices and you know prime next day shipping and everything is right at their fingertips whereas healthcare is still pretty much lagging behind a lot of these things and so you're taking this consumer mindset from patients and they want increased transparency they want um, you know, more as more ownership over their entire process so they can choose, well, you know, I'm shopping for imaging procedures or I, you know, I know I need to do a, an outpatient surgery. I can do it in ASC or a hospital and here are my cost choices. And so they, they have a much more developed consumer mindset. And then, um, you know, the, the next slide we'll talk about is really alludes to why patient AR continues to get a little, you know, more and more. And it's how long it takes to collect from patients. Um, so that we look at kind of a, we call it an age trial balance or an ATB of open AR and the burn down rate for patient accounts receivable. And you look at like, it's taking you six months to collect even a, a, the majority of your patient AR. And so because that delay and because it takes so much longer to collect from patients, you know, you're seeing this decelerated cash, you're seeing this large disconnect between, hey, our date of service was months ago, like, and then, you know, now we're, it's five, six months later, there's a really big disconnect. And, and there's a slide coming up in a few minutes that will talk about why there is such a disconnect and, uh, and what you can do to, uh, you know, alleviate some of that. So that's just setting the context on maybe why, why thinking about prioritizing your patients and flipping it from a very back end of revenue cycle to almost the front end of your revenue cycle makes a lot of sense. So that, um, some things that we want to talk about from a, a benefits and tips for, for upfront collections. And so as mentioned, this is uh, kind of the, the why it is so weird to me and like a lot of consumers in healthcare that we collect anything. I mean, there is a massive disconnect between services rendered and invoiced for charges. And the reason, this is basically your, your high level hierarchy, hierarchy in revenue cycle. So that starts with a patient needing care, seeking out a provider, whether that is a you know primary care physician, going to the ER, uh, you know something that's planned, 
they need care, so they get on a provider schedule. They then meet with a provider, whether it's a you know an inpatient stay, a surgery, go to the ED, meeting with a physician, an MDDO, a, an advanced care practitioner like a nurse practitioner or PA. All that is this big clinical care bubble, and that in of itself is overwhelmingly stressful for patients who like don't want to be in a doctor's office or in an ER or in a hospital. And then you go through a bunch of insanely complex nuance that your normal average patient doesn't understand the charge entry process, the billing process. You're going through an adjudication cycle with your insurance companies. If you're fighting denials, it can take months to get that, uh, that claim of paid just to be able to drop a statement to patient responsibility. And so you look at like at the very end of the line, you have this patient billing and all of these milestones and checkpoints that happen before the patient even sees its first, their first invoice. And they're like, why am I getting a bill five months later? Like, this is super confusing. And why am I getting multiple bills? I've got one, one from the hospital, one from the anesthesiologist, one from a physician group or medical group that did some of my follow-up. I'm getting this weird DME bill. Like, healthcare is hard. <laughs> I've you know spent my entire professional career in it. I still learn things all the time. So it's you know we cannot expect a patient to uh, to be able to hop in and be experts like uh, like many of you. So um, that that's one of the like systemic issues that I I believe um, has caused to this like growth in patient AR and this massive consumer frustration in healthcare. And so thinking about what do you do like how can you improve on that process? And one of the biggest things that we've started to see legislative tailwinds kind of pushing are patient cost estimates and improving this uh, this financial transparency between provider and practice, or excuse me, provider and patient. And the really interesting thing is in the trifecta of participants, there is payer, patient, and provider. And there's very little that connects all three of those, right? You think payer and patient, there's premiums and there's network determinations payer and provider, there's contracts and you know the, the other portion of network determinations. And then you have patient provider that is like, I need to see a doctor. I need to see somebody right away. Um, and so patient cost estimates are really an interesting thing because it blends all three of those parties together. So you have the provider who's referencing payer rates, you have the patient who needs care, and then you have the insurance company who says, these are the your outstanding benefits, right? Co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, what do you have left on your out-of-pocket max? It's bringing all of those pieces together and allowing the patient to have a better financial understanding and a allowing the practice to have a cost conversation uh, earlier on in the revenue cycle, right? So going back up to this, instead of patient billing and statements being one of the very last things that happens in revenue cycle, it's now moved up front possibly around you know, the scheduling and registration process. So it jumps, uh, jumps the rung pretty substantially. And you know, we always get asked, well, how do I actually create a patient cost estimate? Well, the first thing you wanna do is understand what you think as a provider or practice, what you're gonna get paid for those services. Now that starts with your insurance contract. If you don't have insurance contract, oftentimes you can use historical claims and remittance data to supplement that. Be like, yeah, I bill 2,992 and 3s to this payer every year, and they pay me $75.38, right? You can use claims data to, to supplement that as needed, but there's a lot of residual benefits to having your actual contract and fee schedule. Namely, like there's a whole tangent of once you know what your contract is, you can look into negotiating rates or modeling what your revenue impact is year over year. So there's a lot of added benefit to understanding your, your contracts. And then you take those, those rates and you pair them up with uh, real-time benefits and eligibility. So it's called the 270-271 transaction, and it allows a provider to basically ping an insurance company in real time and say, is this patient active? What plan do they have? And, and what are their major benefits, right? Deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, the works. And between those, those two components, you can pair up and start to get an idea of, well, you know, we're doing this service or we plan to do this service or we need to auth get an authorization or pre-cert for this CPT code. And then you pair that with your contract and fee schedule and then you layer in benefits and you have a pretty clear and transparent patient responsibility. Um, so that's like, that is more or less the secret sauce on how to start thinking about getting, uh, creating patient cost estimates. 
And we'll dive into a, a few additional uh, details here in a few minutes. But the next thing to think about is how you can deliver that to your patient so that they actually, A, get it, right? How many practices do we work with that have return mail or issues with um, you know, pa patients never even seeing? So patient-friendly delivery and then starting to collect from things. And so the, the big thing is if you're gonna go through the effort of creating an estimate so that your patients understand the financial liability, collect on some of that, collect on some of those deductibles up front, or you know, at a minimum, you should be collecting on every copay, layer in some of your deductibles, some of the coinsurance percentages, and see if we, um, you know, see if you can collect any of that. And, um, you know, talking on one of the questions that we have in here that just got chatted in was insurance does not cover our services, so we bill the patient directly. We have a ton of outstanding invoices. Um, Would this webinar cover that? And so answering that, actually looping it in right with the patient cost estimates, uh, if you're either out of network or you know, fully self-pay, cash pay price for everything, you should definitely be thinking about estimates, um, not only because in a few minutes we're gonna talk about the good faith estimates and the No Surprises Act, because that does come into play for self-pay or uh, self-pay patients when they have to pay out of pocket for it. But also you should be having that financial conversation with your patients and saying, hey, you're coming in for this. And yeah, you know, I'd love to know more about this, the type of practice, you know, whether you're imaging or surgery or a specialty, something like that. Um, but if, if these are not emergent services, you can have that financial conversation with your patients using an estimate and kind of walk through, hey, you know, this is our, this is our price for these services. We can offer these types of discounts for upfront payment. Um, so we'll, yeah, I think this, this is not only apply to insurance, it, because of both the No Surprises Act and Good Faith Estimates, as well as just a good practice to be having that, that financial conversation with your, with your patients as early on in revenue cycle as possible. Um, yeah, I totally think we'll, we'll get into some details there. So that, that outlines the, the general kind of patient cost estimates. What is it? Why is it? And curious to know of the, the groups on with us today, um, flipping into um, a quick polling question. Whoop, did I um, just out of curiosity, do you do you currently collect from your patients up front? So we talked about the um, you know, hey, if you're going to do estimates, you should think about um, actually collecting from your patients. And again, at a minimum, you should be collecting copays because those are very easy to both identify. Right? Are you a PCP or a specialist? Right? Usually, there's a different copay for primary care versus specialist. Um, you know, so like I, you know, I, I may be jaded because I strongly believe in like the consumerism and the, the pricing transparency in healthcare, but definitely think there's a lot of value to be had by um, starting to collect from your patients. And so, yeah, just kind of get an idea of um, who already collects. So give everyone just, uh, you know, another 10, 15 seconds or so, and I'll, I'll get a quick, quick swig of water over here, and then we'll, we'll hop back into some, uh, some gotchas to be aware of when you're creating a patient cost estimate. Sweet, and I uh, really appreciate everyone's participation and, and chatting in with questions. Makes, makes it a lot more fun and enjoyable for me to not listen to myself talk for you know, 40, 45 minutes. So. Awesome. Well, great to see that you know over over three quarters of the participants um, you know are already collecting from patients. Uh, you know, if, if it's copay only, that's a really awesome start. If you're starting to um, get into maybe some deductible payments or flat fee payments for some of those higher dollar scheduled services, you know, awesome stuff. Uh, so thank, thanks for participating. Uh, so as mentioned, just a couple gotchas to be aware of when you're creating estimates, and, and this you know applies for both insurance and uninsured or self-pay self -pay estimates. But uh, as you're running through this, you wanna make sure that you're allocating the right fee schedule to, um, to your patients. And the reason I say that is, you know, let's take Aetna for example, or Cigna, or Blue Cross, or Humana, or United, or a handful of other payers uh, that, that you may work with, and you likely have, you know, your contract is gonna outline multiple plans, products, or fee schedules. And, so you're gonna have an Aetna commercial and probably an Aetna Medicare Advantage and maybe an Aetna, like a managed choice, a, a Medicaid replacement plan. And all three of those products are gonna have different rates. 
Or your, typically your commercial is your highest, your Medicare Advantage tends to be your second highest, and your managed care Medicaid, Medicaid replacement is gonna be your kind of lower reimbursing fee schedules. And so if you're using the wrong fee schedule or you don't have the right fee schedule loaded, it can lead to some false, you know, some inaccuracies or false, uh, incorrect patient balances when the statement comes back. Um, looking through things like benefit attribution and coverage guidelines. So does a, you know, is a patient coming in for their annual wellness check? Well, they probably don't even owe a copay for that annual wellness check because it's preventative and covered at 100%. Um, so some of those coverage guidelines that are that are helpful, um, you know. The, the struggle between guarantor versus patient, if you, if you have a pediatric practice, you know, most, if not all of your patients coming into a pediatric practice are the patient, but not the guarantor. So making sure you're, you're having those conversations with, uh, with patients or with the, the right, uh, I guess, obligatory payer, probably the guarantor. And then something that we a lot of our customers have started to ask us about is, hey, along with estimates, how can I tell patients about outstanding balances without just sending them statements? So, you know, it's a good, it's a good thing to consider is if you can, if you're having a touch point with a patient that's going through the cost component, hey, you might want to think about talking about, hey, you also have a $300 previous balance that's now four months old or five months old. And in some cases, they may not have ever even seen the balance before. Um, you know, a lot of return mail, a lot of bad addresses, chain, you know, if you email or text uh, statements, and you know, sometimes those just get, get lost in transit. We all get a lot of junk email. Um, you know, so just having those conversations around uh, previous balance history. So those are some of the gotchas that I recommend thinking, around, thinking about for uh, when you go to create patient cost estimates. Uh, the next section is, as discussed, was around the, the communication. And so communicating with patients is super weird because you have right now we're spanning like tech evolution like the world has never seen before at such a rapid evolution rate that you're spanning multiple generations that have multiple comfort levels with different types of technologies so you know it, i look at myself as a as a consumer in healthcare and i love when my provider you know sends me a text or an appointment reminder via text or i can access my own portal or i can walk up and there's you know uh to, uh, basically kiosks that I can register myself or they send me all the pre-reg documents and I can do it myself at my own speed. Like for me, I love that. But for my parents, I think they would much prefer to, you know, and I've seen this, they like enjoy walking into the physician office and be like, all right, what do I need to do today? Great. Like, let me spend 15 minutes filling out some forms. And they're just very patient and they have a different preference around how they interact with like healthcare providers, for example. And so you're balancing this like modern friendly approach with this like, well, we need to support the biggest population of healthcare consumers, which is the, the, uh, the aging population. And so just remember, keep that in the back of your mind of how you have to straddle multiple populations. Um, so around communicating these balances, you know, we talked about try your best to communicate things pre-service. And why, you know, aside from the whole financial component, you're going to improve your patient experience, which is, you know, a big differentiator now, practice to practice. It's like, you know, if you're a primary care physician or a family medicine provider, like you have a lot of competition between providers in your network, in your market, in your area. And now you have people looking at, you know, ZocDoc reviews, Google reviews, health grades reviews, you know, you have these, this review platform that if someone says, this was a terrible experience, they billed me, you know, six months after I, you know, had a service, I didn't even know I had a bill left, like that's a really bad patient experience. And so if you can improve transparency and let the patient know ahead of, ahead of time, you're going to be driving a better patient experience, makes them more likely to return back to your practice, leave good reviews, so on and so forth. Um, communicating in a clear and consistent way your payment policies. So I'll share a quick story that I heard about a month ago from, uh, uh, from a practice that was saying, hey, I talked to the pre-registrar and they said, I only had to pay a copay. And then when they got to the, um, the registration desk, they said, oh, based on your, you know, the surgery you're coming in for today, you owe a flat fee of $500 as a down payment on your surgery. And the patient was really frustrated and very confused because the same group had told them two different things on, for the exact same date of service. And so, you know, communicating a consistent payment policy around what's expected. And then um, 
you know, one thing that we hear from some of our groups that they're like, well, what if I quote a patient and they don't like it? Or they're like, I can't pay that. It's like, it's not gonna change, you know, three months later or four months later after the service. Like if a patient's, you know, concerned about the cost of, of care pre-service, it does not, it is not gonna get easier to collect from them, you know, one to two to three months after the data service. So keep that in mind is like, you're, if a patient can't pay, having the conversation earlier rather than later is gonna be beneficial for your, your AR, your bad debt write-offs, and your revenue cycle team who you know, probably doesn't love calling patients and sending you know, statements or letters talking about collections. So um, uh, yeah, just kind of the consistency around like letting your patients know kind of what their balances are. Yeah. Um, so hopping in here, last one, and then uh, we got a question that I'll, I'll circle back to, is making it, e um, excuse me, uh, making it easy to pay for, for care. And so this is, it is so easy in this day and age to pay for things. Like if any of you check out on Amazon, it's almost irresponsibly easy to check out of things these days, right? It's got my credit card saved. I click a button and I've accidentally ordered like a 48 pack of toilet paper or something. You know, it's, it's so easy to buy things. And so uh, you should try and transfer a lot of that, that simplification and ease into your revenue cycle. So, uh, you know, your, your portals, whether you're, you know, you're on Charm or any other practice management system or EHR, you know, integrating with uh, portals, web-based payments, mobile-based payments, text-based payments, uh, accepting multiple different payment types. So we've seen, you know, HSA, FSA cards, uh, patient financing solutions like, you know, like CareCloud, you know, cash, checks, you know, easy, easy ways to accept a lot of different payments. And a funny story that, um, that happened to me about six months ago now, or well, I guess closer to a year at this point was I went, I, I, our, our office is really close to one of the doctors that I, that I attend with my family. And we had just a, you know, simple copay balance outstanding. I went, I was like, oh, I'll just pay on my way there. And I went to pay and they literally didn't have a way for me to pay at the front desk. And I was like, can I just, it was a $35 copay. I was like, I would love to just take care of this right now. Can I pay? And they're like, no, you have to log in. You have to go home, log into your portal and you can make the, the payment online via the portal. Well, I went home. I had no idea that I like had to have kept the previous statement that had an activation code into my portal. So I was like, you know, multiple phone calls later, I was finally able to pay. And I was like genuinely wanting to pay my copay. Um, you know, so those patients that it's maybe a little more difficult to get to, to get payment, grease the wheels, make it effortless and easy for them to, to pay their balances. And then those last two on the left-hand side, uh, looking at card on file auto payments. Um, so this is becoming more and more of a, a normality in, in healthcare is like, yeah, you've got my card on file, charge me my $35 copay. It's effortless, it's easy. You know exactly what's gonna be charged. The practice communicates what the bill is going to be. And say, hey, we've got card one, you know, card ending in one, two, three, four on file. We'll go ahead and take care of that. Um, so that, you know, increasing, increasing your payments through auto payments, big, you know, big thumbs up to that. And then the last, but certainly not least, is, you know, your patient-driven payment plans. So just about every single group that I've worked with that has higher dollar patient balances has at one point or another worked with payment plans. And you know, so what I mean by payment plans is, you know, patient is, is unable to pay in full right then and there. And so they set up some recurring defined payment amount. Maybe it's a three month, six month, 12 month payment plan. But what we've seen is, you know, inconsistent and sometimes like disadvantageous to both parties on how long that payment plan is, is established for. You know, so your group that's someone's, you know, been paying five or ten dollars a month for the last two years, like, a their credit card has probably changed. Like they may have changed banks. Like they've had to go through information to update that. So it's hard on a patient to support that. And you're supporting this AR on your age trial balance every month with a you know five or ten dollar payment. That the you know the cost of supporting that. though there's not an actual cost, but you're literally like you know, a dollar today is worth way more than a dollar two years from now. Um, you know, so think about how the structuring your payment plans so that you can be very consistent and standardized. Maybe it's balanced thresholds. Maybe it says, hey, a, you know, anything under 250, we don't do payment plans for. 
to $1,000 will do up to a six month payment plan. You know, $1,000 to $2,500 will do up to a 12 month payment plan. Anything over $2,500 that needs to be put on a payment plan, you need, you know, a specific conversation. Um, you know, that's something to, to think about restructuring the, uh, your standard operating policies or policies and procedures around payment plans. So, very awesome. Um, so hopping back to one of the questions that we received, uh, so common situation for us, how do we explain to the patient that we know more about the cost and coverage of our services than the, the insurance customer service rep? That, that's a great question. Um, in you know, insurance companies, even with some of the estimators that insurance companies put online, they tend to create it very generally. Like, hey, you're in this zip code, we, th we see a range of reimbursement for this code from you know, 120 to $210. And they give this like very loose buffer of a range. Um, you know, so things that I'd recommend is going back to pulling your fee schedules. Um, so you know, getting the actual rates that you're contracted with the insurance company to be paid, and then showing when to the patient when you ran benefits. So hey, we, you know, what is today? The, the 23rd, say we ran benefits this morning on February 23rd. This is your outstanding deductible, copay, co and any coinsurance to be met until you're out of pocket. And communicate kind of the timing of things, as well as any weird nuance or complexities. So, um, you know, you start with something that is, you know, gross revenue in healthcare is largely a misunderstood thing because for your in-network providers, you're typically not ever touching gross net, gross allowables your, or gross revenue. You're, everything's netted down with contractual adjustments. And so like the best I can do is show them the timing of when everything was presented, that you got coverage. It's a recent coverage, uh, 270, 271 eligibility transaction. And then um, you know, communicate back what's being done, when you plan it's being done, and what services are going to what benefits, such as like deductibles or, you know, or a copay. Um, so yeah, t tough one, especially if they're calling their insurance rep to be like, what, you know, what do I owe for this? But would, you know, would recommend trying to be as transparent as possible and providing them enough data that they, they have all the pieces they need without it becoming one of your traditional healthcare statements that has like a ton of adjustments and dollars that aren't even in use. So a couple, couple recommendations. Um, and the last thing touching here is kind of knowing what you can and cannot do around uh, collecting and communicating to patients. And so one of the big ones is your know, Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. Right? As, a, as a provider group, you have different, you have a basically different cap of uh, what you're enabled to do than maybe a third party debt collection agency. And so knowing kind of when and where you can try and collect, right? You can't overhound people. You can't bombard them with phone calls, with emails, with texts. You can't show up on their front doorstep and be like, hey, you've got a $100 payment outstanding to us. And so knowing what you can and cannot do, the uh, fair debt is, a, is one of the biggest ones that we, uh, that we see as a provider that you're kind of restrained a little bit from getting too aggressive the same way that a, you know, a collections agency would. Uh, the, tele, the TCPA, Telephone Consumer Protection Act, um, you know, big thing with, with our platform, every time we text a patient, we get a HIPAA consent that A, we are talking to the right person. So whether it's name, date of birth, or last four of social and date of birth, it goes through a digital HIPAA consent so that we know we're talking to the right person and they have a consent that we, uh, they basically authorized communication between platforms. Um, so, you know, documented consent is a big one. And then, you know, always an opt out. I think you, if any of you get spam texts, you'll see that uh, so many of them have a you know, reply stop to opt out. That is because of the TCPA that you have to have the ability to you know, opt out of those, those texts. Um, the last two, you know, HIPAA is, you, you're all you know, very familiar with HIPAA. You know, it's mentioned like to be, to be an EHR, your world revolves around HIPAA and, and the data interoperability there, but make sure that you know, you're, you're taking prote protections and precautions to, you know, to limit your, your risk of a, of a breach. Um, you know, HIPAA notifications and breaches can be pretty painful. There's a, a website that publishes every single breach that's been, uh, been reported and there's a lot of fines on there. Um, so making sure that you know, you're, you're keeping patient data secure. And then the last little thing, it's not really a, a you know, black or white policy, but it is just grading yourself internally on your, your own financial policies. 
is do you have you know, statement notifications? What is your process around collecting from patients? Do you send three statements, a letter, and then it's bad debt? How do you write off balances? What, do you, you know, what is the process? Does it go to a third party collections agency? Do you have an early out collections vendor? Um, so going through the process of collections and the actual balance write-offs and controls is a good thing to just, you know, before you really start going deep into knocking down your patient AR, uh, make sure that you have consistent financial policies established and documented. So, um, so that kind of wraps up the communication section. And then, you know, maybe the moment you're all waited for, waiting for, uh, cranking through some, some good faith estimate stuff. Um, so the good faith estimates, it, it's effective this year. And, uh, you know, it is, I think a lot of people are still learning about kind of how, how these are going to be enforced, what it, you know, who, what is the real risk points, who do I need to be, who's going to come knocking on my door if I have, you know, if I'm not compliant. And so we've kind of summarized or done our best to summarize some kind of key themes or objectives of the No Surprises Act, including the good faith estimates. Um, so number one, uh, and this goes back to a question that was previously submitted about, hey, we don't, you know, we don't have insurance. Does this apply? Your self-pay or uninsured patients. So if you don't sec if you don't take insurance at your practice, this left box is going to apply for you, and that is uh, protecting um, protecting out of uh, self-pay patients from astronomical bills. And so this applies to all provider types. So whether you're a physician group, a hospital, or an ambulatory surgical center, a standalone imaging center, uh, you need to be able to, upon request, produce an estimate for a self-pay estimate or for a self-pay patient. And there's some kind of components there that's like, did I do it right? Uh, so the first thing is, if the patient is requesting an estimate, then um, or once the service is scheduled and the patient requests an estimate, you have a turnaround time. So you have basically three days before, um, or three days after the service is initially scheduled to provide that estimate back for a patient. But if the uh, if it's a short, you know, maybe a next day add on or two or three days out, then you have to get that turned around in one business day. So that is that is pretty quick resolution time. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the requirements of a good faith estimate here in a few slides. So certain things like including procedures, descriptions, tax IDs, NPIs, locations. So we'll talk about some of the requisites there, but a good faith estimates applies to, you know, all of your self-pay or uninsured patients and kind of getting a, a, another feel for what you've been doing for, you know, the last couple of months as we, this has been live now for nearly two months, uh, flipping into this next poll, <coughs> excuse me, polling question around what does your office currently do for good faith estimates? And just want to see kind of what, what you have laid out. Do you have anything, you know, do you have a software vendor that you're already starting to work with? Are you getting by with spreadsheets, Word docs, you know, just almost making it up as you go, no current process, or, or do you have anything else? Um, so we'll give her just a, a few minutes and, you know, this is, do not feel bad if no current process is, you know, is the, is the thing that's selected because a lot of, a lot of practices are still figuring out like, well, what's our risk? What's our liability? How do we, um, what should we be doing or taking into account? What's the urgency to, to get this resolved? So, you know, we, we see a lot of still figuring it out, um, at a lot of practices. So we'll give everyone just a, a few more minutes to, um, or a few more seconds to get, uh, get your answers in. And then we'll talk about components of the good faith estimate to make sure that if you have a solution in place that you're kind of checking the box on all these. Um, so we'll go ahead and close this out. And yeah, curious, curious to know. And yep, the, the two biggest ones, you know, no current process. And uh, we're, we're trying to get by with the spreadsheets or PDFs, Word docs. So those are kind of split between the, the top, two, uh, top two answers. So yeah, love that. Um, well, if you have no current process and are using spreadsheets, hopefully this next, uh, this next slide will help you basically be a, an audit checklist of, of are you in compliance with the requirements of the GFEs. Um, so running down this fairly exhaustive list of what these require, um, you know, you're going to want patient name and date of birth. Those are the demographic points. And then we mentioned this, the description of the primary item or service in clear and understandable language. Now, this, there's no clear definition of what clear and understandable really means, but if you've all ever looked at the CMS short descriptions for a CPT code, 
Sometimes it is just complete, utter gibberish. And so if there's anything you can do to simplify the explanation and say, oh, this was actually just a knee arthroscopy, um, you know, that, that's going to be helpful. Uh, the actual CPT and ICD codes. Um, so whether, you know, coming in for a 27130 or a 99213 and the associated diagnosis codes are both components of the good faith estimates. And then the expected charges that the patient will incur. And so, again, the, the financial piece is kind of the biggest thing around good faith estimates is helping patients know what their liability may be for, for that specific date of service. Um, so the expected charges, and then you have a bunch of provider information. So who are the providers and where are the facilities that services are being rendered? So like location, right? We consider this on our, in Rivet, we call it a service location. Is it, you know, Memorial General Hospital and they're, you know, one, two, three Main Street. Uh, the tax ID of the group, the NPI of the provider. And then the last little thing that is still evolving and, and isn't really in full in force yet is any adjunct or ancillary providers to that service. And so those could be labs, the anesthesiologist, if you're a physician and you're trying to estimate for you know a surgical procedure, will there be a hospital or an OR involved? Um, and so looking through some of the, uh, we call them co-provider or co-facilities, kind of the timeline of those. And, and we can gloss over this kind of quickly because it's not in effect yet, but um, you'll see right now we need the good faith estimates and you've got a timeline of when you can create that good faith estimate. And then by 2023, you should be able to include uh, any of your ancillary providers in conjunction with your primary group. So how we've tackled this is we call it multiple treatments. So you may have one treatment that's the provider charges or physician charges for a surgery. Then you have a, an ASC charge for the technical component, right? The, the operating room that things are being done in. Then you have a, an anesthesiology charge. You can create all three of those treatments on an estimate and have different, you know, even different fee schedules, different allowables, different benefit rates for each of those things that layer on top of each other. Um, so it's a, um, it is an upcoming requirement, and then I, you know, we, we don't believe that the enforcement will be too strong until 2023, but because there's a lot of things in play here, we recommend starting to think about how you'd be able to gather information from some of your top network participants from you know, anesthesiologists, uh, operating rooms, co-providers, anything like that. And, and what those estimates, kind of how they boil up to look, is um, you're going to have, you know, once all that is said and done, right, basically this long exhaustive list of what's on the estimate and making sure that at time you have all of your co-providers, you then have a disclaimer. Um, and the disclaimer is basically going to state, and, and this is where the legality starts to, um, to play, uh, play a part, is if there is a drastic deviation from your estimate to what's actually billed, a patient has the right to dispute, and there's a, a whole formal dispute resolution process. And so, you know, stating that it is a good faith estimate, but it is subject to change. Uh, stating that there may be additional items or services that are not contained in the good faith estimate. Uh, looking at the right to initiate a dispute and talk through dispute resolution process, um, specifically that sub bullet right there, how can they initiate this process? And then, you know, this good faith estimate is not a contract. It is not an end all be all, like, you know, there it's possible that residual balances will come out. Um, so that's the disclaimer on a good faith estimate. And then, you know, just a couple more slides and then we'll circle back to some of the questions. Um, you know, this is a CMS good faith estimate example. Like they provide this online. Again, this looks like a ton of data to fill out. So there's a lot of really good vendors that, uh, you know, Riv include and how, you know, we work with multiple EHR and EMR platforms and integrate well, but like, this is it. If you fill this out in totality, you, you know, you've kind of checked all the boxes. So um, this is a, you know, really good example of the, the good faith estimate. And then talking through the pieces of, of how we do that and how we put it all together. Um, you know, the perfect estimate we think consists of, of four key, ben four key components. Uh, the first one <coughs> over here on the left-hand side is uh, your uniquely contracted payer rates or the expected charges if it's a self-pay patient. Um, it, the followed on with comprehensive patient information. Um, so this goes back to the one of the questions, um, you know, is it required for insured patients as well? 
And, and that's where it touches on the out of network piece for insured patients. And so, you know, the, the No Surprises Act kind of creeps into the um, protecting patients from high balloon out of network estimates or out of network statements and bills by providing them with an estimate for in network rates. That's where the, that's a little more No Surprises Act than good faith estimates. But yeah, you want to know if the patient's in network or out of network because there are blossoming protections for out of network patients to avoid that uh, the high dollar balances. Uh, the third component, which is probably the newest piece for a lot of practices when creating estimates, is what codes are do you forecast are going to be on the estimate. Now remember, going back up to this list of you know requirements, there are CPT codes and ICD-10 codes. And so getting the coding piece in line, that's typically, you know, it's a lot easier for you know, a practice that needs a pre-certain authorization for surgery because you're generally submitting those CPT codes anyways with diagnosis codes. And so that's a little bit easier, but you know, for someone who's not seeking an authorization or a payer that you don't traditionally have to authorize for, um, you know, you think about the process to get those CPT codes in a system. And the nice thing about most EHRs and is they're, you know, they're so clickable where you, know, you can have a, a coder come in and look at the appointment type and say, oh, this, this patient's coming in for this, this, and this. We're going to create a service template that is, you know, an office visit, an imaging procedure, and something else. Um, so that's how you can kind of factor in what codes you're going to bill for this visit. And then the meatiest part that is kind of the, the black box of intelligence is how any payers are going to adjudicate this claim. So if, if it's a self-pay patient for a good faith estimate, it's do you take adjustments? Do you apply things like multiple procedure uh, reductions or modifiers that would change the allowable? If it's an insurance company, they define those policies and says, hey, if you're, if you're billing Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, Humana, United, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, they all have predefined policies that says, what does a modifier do? What does multiple procedure do? What does a, an, uh, a nurse practitioner get paid relative to a physician or an MDDO? And so those, you know, that's a big, a lot of logic that you put together. And that's why it is pretty beneficial to have, you know, something that has all of this built out of the box, ready to go. And is it a compliant way that it basically is a much more polished version of, of what CMS puts out, but gives you a lot of uh, a lot of really good information. Yeah. Um, so that like that's kind of the content we we wanted to review today. Um, there's a, there's a couple questions that that I'll get to. Um, so first, you know, does this apply to insured patients at all, or just uninsured and self-pay? Great question. Um, <coughs> and talked about this briefly that the good faith estimates. Uh, applies mostly to your self-pay or uninsured patients, but part of the No Surprises Act applies to the difference between an out-of-network and in-network rate and treating those out-of-network patients with in-network allowables. And so that's something um, that, you know, you're thinking about, hey, like, what do I even use as a benchmark for out-of-network patients for an in-network rate? And that's where there's a lot of, I'd say, evolving content around like, what is in network? Do I have to pick the lowest payer? Do I pick an average? Do I pick a comparable commercial payer? You know, say I've got, you know, United Healthcare pays me really well, but I've got an out of network Aetna patient. Like, do I reconcile those two? Um, you know, so um, in short, the good faith estimate is mostly around self pay and uninsured patients. The No Surprises Act is around insured patients that are out of network for your group facility. And it, it's really focused, I mean, the, the goal of that was to avoid surprise out of network participation. So you go you know, to an emergency room and because of EMTALA, you know, the, the ER or ED that you go to has to treat you to at least get you medically stabilized uh, before you know, any questions are really asked. But a lot of times within that, you either move up for a surgery or you have to have anesthesia for that surgery. And the provider that renders that is out of network. And you didn't know that even though you went to an in-network ER or hospital, you know, maybe the, uh, this, the, excuse me, the ancillary providers associated with that um, are, are out of network. So that, that's where the no, uh, excuse me, the no Surprises Act is starting to protect those insured but out of network patients. Um, great questions. Um, next, would a good faith estimate also apply to an MD who offers alternative considered non-medical treatments? We don't use the codes because they don't apply to us. We don't use labs. We offer Zoom services. 
Um, this is kind of interesting. I, I haven't actually heard this question before. And um, you know, if it's if it is not a billable CPT code, or or you know, you never code anything up from a a CPT or ICD-10 kind of standpoint, um, I I don't believe you'd put anything on at that point. Yeah, I, I'd love to know some more examples. Maybe you know we can connect offline and I can provide some more context after looking at some of those. But yeah, I, I can imagine that you know if it's not a it's not a medical treatment, there's nothing to estimate, and it's very optional for the patient to um, to you to render those services. But yeah, would love to know more. Um, uh, any software that would work with Charm EHR standalone to provide a good faith estimate? Uh, yeah, I mean. There, there's a lot of systems. Um, we Rivet, for example, you know, we, we connect through Charm either uh, primarily through an HL7 connection. Um, so that, that's one way that, that Rivet works with Charm. Uh, I'd say there, if you're able to get a patient data feed from your EHR, you know, from, from Charm specifically, if you can get a patient data feed, then uh, several platforms, Rivet including, can populate all the rest of the data like benefits and eligibility or, um, uh, or the fee schedules from your insurance companies. And so, yeah, like what I'd say connect with, with your Charm team. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us at, at Rivet Health and either connect through the Charm team or directly with Rivet. So yeah, great question. Um, uh, so um, last couple here. Uh, what platform do you recommend for mobile pay and web pay? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good one because there's you know, a lot of them developing. Um, you know, try and integrate it as best as possible. So if you're your EHR or PM vendor, you know, if you're in Charm or anything like that and you can accept uh, mobile or web-based payments, like great, it's gonna be fully integrated. It'll save your, you know, you'll be able to auto post things back if, if necessary. Um, a lot of practice management systems have some type of, of payment processor integrated. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a lot of platforms like, you know, one thing that I really like about Rivet is you can text, you know, text a link to a patient cost estimate. You can email a link to a patient cost estimate. It gets processed. It gives you a posting file of all the cleared payments. You know, it's it's pretty straightforward to be able to um, to work with those. But yeah, check with your EMR practice management vendor and see if they have any preferred integrations, because that's going to mean that hopefully they'll post things. You know, from a cash posting standpoint, they'll post back. Uh, you know, pretty quickly and make it so it's a, you know, that closed loop batch reconciliation for, for cash posting will be, um, it'll be a lot more seamless.